Thank you for being here today. If you're visiting, we're so happy that you're here. Uh, maybe that you were the first person ever in this building. We're happy you're here too. Uh, I hope that you'll enjoy the study of the morning. It's not necessarily designed uh, about leadership necessarily, but I think there's some things that need to be said, and I've been, been heavy on my heart, so I'm going to say them today. <clears throat> uh, well, I asked Daryl if he was going to mess with me again. Because it seems like every time I get up here, there we go. Thanks, buddy. All right. The subject. Come on, baby. <laughs> what am I doing wrong, brother? Is it me? I think it's me. This is a green button. I am mashing the green button. Do I need to quit mashing the green button? Give me a chalkboard. Someone got a chalkboard around here? I mean, it's good. It's not working. I don't care if I say advanced slide, whatever's going to work. It's strange that it works till I get up here. It's work for everyone. There we go. There's my subject. Men. <laughs> what do you think of? Thanks, gentlemen. Thank y'all. Was it me? I don't know. Okay. What do you think of when you hear the word men? Now, uh, whatever you may think of, I want to tweak that a little bit. And what do you think of when you hear about men in the news? Or if you hear a news article about men, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Well, I will tell you what comes to my mind is, well, men are bad. Just a headline from just a couple of weeks ago, this the cowboy mentality. I think of men being oppressive. I hear that a lot nowadays. Men are oppressive. Uh, maybe this one right here. Toxic masculinity. You heard that phrase a lot? I want to talk to you about men today in maybe a little bit different way. Uh, and I'd ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to have these passages on the screen, but we're going to read the bulk of Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to just take a fresh look with me. Take a fresh look at men. And I want you to think about how God has designed men. And I know about half of you here today are not men. And so maybe you, you get to kind of have an easy one today, but I'm going to tell you what, most of the half of you here today that are not men are married to a man or are raising young men, so I think these things are important. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Notice verse 4 in particular. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And I think New King James and some other versions, it says this is the history. That's what he says. And so God in Genesis chapter 1, he creates and he tells us everything, all the little details in the order. And then in chapter 2, he talks about the seventh day a little bit here. And then he says, I'm going to give you a little, a brief history of what's happened. Okay. <clears throat> every plant of the field before it was on the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And notice what he says, there was not a man to till the ground. 
Now, I'm just going to tell you the nature of men. I believe we can find it right here. Man is a workhorse. Men have been designed by God to labor and to work. That is the purpose of man. And God waited for it to rain till there was a man because he needed a man to till the ground. And I submit to you today that the heart and soul of men is to work. It's the heart and soul of men. Verse 6, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. God planted a garden and he puts a man in there. Why? To work. He puts a man there. Now listen carefully. Before there was ever a woman, he puts a man in a garden and says, work. Notice what he says. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God's putting things in place here that are going to be, and the law for man to follow, a law that's going to be good for him, and it's going to help him along the way. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and it became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedalium and an onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Jehon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hiddekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, exactly why he describes all this stuff about the rivers, I don't know. I don't necessarily see an application for the purpose today. But I want you to notice verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And everything's in place in there. And there's no woman. There's just man. A man who works. A man who God's given a law to dress and keep. And he's put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil therein. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of, the tree of, the no of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Have you ever noticed that the law was given to man before there was ever a woman? And God has designed this creature, man, and he's built him. And he's made a place for him. And he's given him a nature. A nature that's in man. It's irrefutable. It's not changeable. It's the way he's made man. And there's still no women. Isn't that interesting? And the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And so there's a great parade of the animals and creatures that come by in front of Adam and he names them. Horse and cow and pig and that's all the farm animals or I won't get into the exotic ones. But here's Adam and these animals are coming by and the truth is it's a search for a help meet. That's what it is. Is there a partner for this man? And this is the second great nature of man. One is he's a worker. And two is he needs a partner. He needs a helper, a mate. And so they're looking and all these animals come by and Adam names them as they come by. <clears throat> And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. Go to sleep. Why, why, why would he do that? Why, why wouldn't he just go, you're not going to want to be here to see this, Adam. I want you to go to sleep. Do you ever go to sleep and wake up and wonder where you are? I've done it every time I come home to Nigeria. I wake up and go, where in the world am I? Not a good feeling. Adam goes to sleep. And he wakes up. And the Bible, go back one. Thanks, buddy. 
He took one of the ribs and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and he brought her into the man. He wakes up and what's standing here? This beautiful creature. I'm not like anything else he's ever seen. This, this divine creature is standing before him. And Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall the man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I'm going to tell you right here in these, these verses of scripture, right here we have the purpose of man. Give me another one. Why not create the woman first? Could have done that. God could have just created the woman. He could have made her have a baby. That baby could have got things going. Wouldn't have needed a man at all. And you know what? There's a whole lot of people in the world today that say the same. We don't need a man at all. We don't need men. And if you watch the news, the word on the news is we don't need men. Men are terrible and men are mean and men are oppressive and men are hard and men are bad and wrong and everything else. You know what? God did it right. I'm here to say if you're a feminist today, I'm sorry, I love you. God did it right. Next slide. This is bone of my bones. This is mine. This beautiful creature. This is my son. Y'all know my son. I tell you, he just rocked along in life. Was a very normal kid. And one day, he got to being real sneaky and real secretive. And I was like, what have you, what have you been doing? And finally, the truth came out. He said, I met a girl. Met a girl. This was the girl. Next slide. And then next thing you know, he's down on his knee. And he's got a ring. And, he, and we were all shocked. This is serious. Next slide. And then they walked down the aisle. I want to tell you, this young man found purpose in his life. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Next slide. And guess what? Here he come. This little bone of my bones, this little flesh of my flesh. You see? Next slide. And there's purpose. I want you to think about the purpose of man. What, is a man, what does a man need to do? What fulfills a man? You know what is in every man? A brute beast, yes. In every man, there's a little piece of every man who wants to dominate the world. Who wants to be the king. He wants to be Hitler. He wants to be Caesar and dominate the world and have a harem of women and people come at his beck and call. And you know what tames that in a man? Bone of my bone. Tames it tames it and it gives man purpose to drive and push give me the next slide please next one too and one more <laughs> God has put in the hearts of men the pathway to fulfillment okay I want you to think about this with me and study this with me God has put in every man the pathway to fulfillment next slide and that pathway is a sense of duty to provide for his family next slide to nurture, to protect, to grow, to love his family. That is the pathway to fulfillment. That's what keeps a man from being a brute beast. And it's what gives a man purpose in his life. To love a beautiful creature. And to care for the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh and to provide and love and nurture and see that family grow and flourish. It's what makes men, well, be men. Now, next slide. <clears throat> One more. Did you know men make the world work? Men make it work. I, men are oppressive and evil and mean, and I know what the news is saying, but I want to tell you, without sewers and high lines and scuba divers and high ride building and some man growing wheat and raising beef and hogs and butchering chickens, where would you be? You like to have a chicken nugget? 
But guess what? Men raise chickens, and men butcher chickens. Now, you feminists, get over it. If you want a chicken nugget, it's going to be a man who makes that happen. Next slide. Men do the banking, the accounting, the investing, and the record keeping. They build roads, tunnels, bridges. They mine the natural resources of the world. They process timbers and make buildings, electricity, generating dams. Did you know that young, tough men die every day so you can be free? And when trouble comes and war comes, it will not be soccer moms in many vans saving the world. It will be young men who will die and have died by the millions. I'll tell you what, guys. Most men are good. Only 1% of men commit 63% of all violent crime. Most men are good. And most men in this world are dedicating to providing civilization. Next slide, please. They make the world work. And whatever your feeling is about men or feminism... You need to thank men that there's a toilet that you can go do your business on, that there's electricity that keeps you warm, and that there's HVAC that keeps you cool. And you may say, well, Brother Sean, I'm sure there's some women who climb high-line towers. That's absolutely true. That's very true. But I want to tell you what. At the end of the day, men make the world work. Do they stumble and fall? Yes, they do. The vast majority of men spend themselves... And the worthy cause of civilization. And I'm just going to tell you a fact. Men do not get down in the sewers and clean out the sewers because they want to oppress their wife. They just don't. Okay. Within the hearts of men is a desire, should be a desire, to provide for his family. And I want to read a few scripture with you. First Timothy 5, verse 8. If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith. So one of the roles of men is certainly to provide for your family. There should be food on the table and clothes for their backs and all those kinds of things. And the truth is, most of us men take that way overboard most times. We need to provide in faith for our family. Provide faith. And as a man, you have a responsibility to be a man of God. You. It's your bone of bone, your flesh of flesh. Take control of your family and teach your family to love God. Because if we don't provide for our own, we've denied the faith. And he says that's worse than an unbeliever. So there's a few points, and I think they're probably familiar to you in some way, but I think they need to be said. Psalms 104, 21, the young lions roar after their prey. They seek meat from their God. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. You know what? This is kind of true, isn't it? Men get up every morning, don't you? You go to work. When when you come home in the evening, you come home. And the bulk of your day is doing what? Labor and working. That's naturally so. And then there's some downtime, right? There's some time off. And I want to tell you gentlemen something. That's the most important hours of the day. Listen to me carefully. What you do with those four or five hours is giant. It's enormous. Because you're going to have to get up and go to work. And unless you're really successful and can retire at age 52, because I'm 52 and that's not in sight, you're going to be working a long, long time. And you're going to get up every morning. You're going to go to work. Next slide. <clears throat> you men, I need you to listen. Listen, because this is important. Those few hours a day matter. And you need to use those hours of the day to change the destiny of your family. To focus your home on God. Next slide, please. James 3.13. Who is wise and understanding among you? I'll ask you a question. Who's wise? Who's a smart guy? 
Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. I want to tell you, there's a whole lot of guys that get to the later years of their life and they look back and go, man, I didn't do very good. I wish I would have changed what I did with my wife. I wish I would have changed what I did with my job. I wish I would have changed what I did with my family. I don't know how many people I've sat down with, husbands and wives, and they weep and they cry and go, I wish I would have done something different with my family. And you know what they did? They went to work, and maybe they worked 9 to 5, or maybe they worked a whole lot of overtime, but then they come home and they did something else besides be a family man. He says in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now listen to me carefully. We need strong men. This this church needs strong men. Your, Your wife deserves a strong man. Your children deserve strong men, godly men who love the Lord. It takes a lot of uh, effort. It takes a lot of will. It it takes a lot of strength to go work and work hard every day. But I'll tell you what, that's given. That's the nature of a man. The strength comes when we come in and grit our teeth and do this right here. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You men have a responsibility to put on the whole armor of God. Not one little piece of armor. Not no armor, all the armor. Why? He says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers or darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want you to think about it, gentlemen. There's a war going on right now under your nose. A battle. For the hearts and souls, not only of your children, but of the whole world. And unless you have the armor of God, unless you have put on these spiritual tools of warfare, you're going to struggle and you're going to fail. And when you fail, your family fails. Because it's bone of my bone. You know how many men I run into that don't have a shield, don't know how to use a shield? How hard is it to use a shield? I have men that come to me and go, where is that verse in the Bible? What verse? Oh, that verse about baptism. You don't know. You got trouble. You're married and got a couple of kids and you don't even know how to use a shield. You don't know how to use a sword. You got a lot of work to do. Because you're going to work nine to five and then you're going to come home. What are you going to do? You can play a few video games, three or four hours. When are you going to put on the armor of God? When are you going to do that? When are you going to learn how to carry the shield and to fight this spiritual battle that's going on right now under our noses? There is a war going on right now to redefine the nature of men to redefine the nature of sexuality to redefine what a home is. It's happening right now. And folks, we're losing. The schools in America, we got trouble. And we need men who can take a little child and say, here's how you hold a shield. Here's how you use a sword. Oh, it's a shame that we got to teach little children about those kinds of things, but we do. It's here, and it's real, and it's happening now. He says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day is here. We're in it. We're living in it and walking in it. And you need to equip yourself. And I'm going to tell you, my friend, when you come home from work, that's when you got to put on these things. Take time to study your Bible. We preach about studying the Bible all the time. Why is that important? Because of this. Because if you don't study your Bible and you don't teach your kids, you're going to have a son or a daughter who's going to come to you and say, I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, I'm the other. It'll come and it'll be right in your lap. Next slide. 
Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Can you imagine standing and using a shield while fiery darts are coming at you? Can you imagine the fear that you'd have and how happy you'd be to have it? And can you imagine sending a child out onto a field of battle with no shield? And it'd just be cannon fodder. And I'm going to tell you what, folks. There are children in the world today who are absolutely cannon fodder for the devil. You want to know why? Because they don't have a dad. Because there's no man to stand and show them how to do these things. Ephesians 6, 17 Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. I could go on and on about this for hours, and I probably should. I hope you get the point. Equip your family. Put the TV down, the video games down, all that junk, and be a man. And teach your kids and equip your kids with the tools that they need. Next slide. Do your children know what fornication is? Next slide. Do your kids know how dangerous pornography is? Do you ever check to see what's on your child's phone? Can your children use the shield and the sword? Next slide. Why not? Why not? In Ephesians 5 and 14, he saith, Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Gentlemen, you need to wake up. Wake up! And look at what's happening around you. You young fellas, wake up! You old men, wake up. And let's look at what's happening in the world. It's time to put the toys and games down. It's time to get serious about living and be a man. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he said, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. Next slide. You know, the word means to act manly. Now give me the next one. Thayer says to make a man of or make brave, to show oneself a man. Why would Paul write to the church at Corinth and say, Why don't you act like a man? Because I will tell you why. Some of them weren't. And it is not manly to neglect to teach your family and train your family. It's not manly. It's not manly to get so caught up in all the things of the world you don't have time for them or for the church. It's not manly. Next slide. I want to show you some simple things that destroy men. Let's go. Pride, lust, greed, slothfulness. Destroy men. And I want to tell you, as men go, the family goes. And I see a lot of guys who are filled up with pride. And I want to tell you, it destroys them. You know what pride does? It's just like a fog, a mist, and it causes you to not be able to see. And you can't see it when you're doing the wrong things. You can't see when you're acting a fool. Pride will cause you to waste every bit of spare time that you have and think it's great. That's what pride does. And lust... Lust is an absolute destroyer. It's a cancer. And I'm talking about in the church. You get started down that road of lust and pornography. You think about Solomon. He had 700 wives and it wasn't enough. And lust just destroys people. And greed is the same way. And we have men who neglect their families to work, 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 work. You want to know why? Because they got to drive a big jacked up pickup. They got to have a fancy car and they got to have a boat and they got to have, 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 have. And then there's a few that just don't want to do nothing. They won't lift a finger for the family. To teach the family. To train the family. Okay, next slide. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Put it away, folks. Put this junk away. I guess every old man says it, and I suppose I'm in the category. You, you do not have much time. 
you do not have much time to teach and train your kids. They're going to be grown and gone. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee off spoil useful lust. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Follow these things, pursue these things, and dedicate your children to these things. All the wasted time at some point in your life you would love to have to go back and put toward these things. Next slide. 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Guess what, guys? Guess what, dads? Not only do you need to be teaching and training your wife and your children, you need to be teaching and training some other men who didn't have that kind of training. We need strong men who work hard and then devote themselves to godly pursuits and godly things. That's what we need. Will it be hard? Yeah. It'll be hard. Because you're going to come home and go, boy, I ain't had time for nothing. I hadn't had time to turn around. Yeah, you'll be tired. You'll be weary. Well, I'll tell you what, there's some things that are important right now, and you need to prioritize your life. Get your life right now, and work hard now, and you know what? It'll pay off in spades of joy later, and tons of joy later on. Next Friday. And ye fathers, provoke not your children wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's only a little window to do that. Just a little window, and then it's gone. <clears throat> First Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. You know what? I see men fighting. You know what they fight? Government. Hate the government. Mad about the government. Government's bad. You know, I get it. I know men that fight politics. Boy, they're mad. You, they got Fox News 24-7. I'm going to tell you, they're angry and they're hostile and they're angry and mad at everybody and everything, and they just want to fight. I see it. I feel it. I understand. I see guys who want to fight the tax man. Boy, they hate the tax man. I don't like the tax man or lady. And they grump and gripe and groan and they spend every waking hour figuring out a way to get a little bit less that they have to give to the tax man. And I see guys who fight NFL and the NHL and the NBA and on and on. I'm going to tell you, they fight. They, they wage more. Old oh, NASCAR, I like that too. And I got my people and I will tell you, we'll have a long talk and they can spend hours studying, focusing, doing it. And I'll tell you what, they'll fight, 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 fight. We see it every day. I'm, I've done it. I'm here to tell you. I'm not here to say I'm the man. I'm not saying I'm the man. I'm saying I get it. Next slide. Do you realize, you men, say it, Satan's chewing you up. That's exactly what he... Lord told Peter, Satan wants to have you. Does, is he going to pet you on the head and tell you you're a good boy? No, he's going to tear you up. And what's, it's what's happening in our world. There ain't a person here who likes the direction our world is going. I want to tell you, Satan is tearing the world up, and he's doing it by tearing up men. Now, you can fight with anything you want to fight. You can do that. You, you want to spend all your waking hours to become the best chess player you can be. You do it. You can spend that fight. Spend that energy. I want to tell you, at the end of the day, it is on your shoulders to be a man. At the end of the day, God has given you the direction and the tools to be the best man that you can be. But you've got to embrace it and work. And you know what? It's the only thing that will fulfill you. The only thing. 
And God has blessed us with that path. Become the man God wants you to be. You need to be the man God wants you to be. If your family's hurting, it's on you, my friend. The buck stops with you. If your kids need direction, it's on you. If your wife is struggling, it's on you, my brother, to be a man and become the man God would have you be. It's no small task. I'll tell you what, brother, you better start today, today, to be that man. And if you're spending all your time fighting in other things, that's foolish. You need to change that. Change it today. And be the man that God wants you to be. Be the man that God has designed you to be. Be the man that God has called you to be. I'm going to tell you what your family needs. And I'm not even here. I've not been in your home. But I can tell you what your family, your family needs you to step up. As a fa- father, a husband, a teacher, a trainer, that's, what, that's what's needed. This church needs you to step up to help this church to grow. We're going through leadership. We need men who love the Lord and who will follow the Lord and dedicate their selves and their time to the Lord. That's what we need. I'll tell you what, folks. This world needs men. Now, we got a few moments here. We're going to sing a song, and, and you're, you're intelligent people. If you're a man who's sitting here in these pews today feeling guilty, you need to change. Because I'm going to tell you, I've sat right there in those pews and felt ashamed of my life. I felt ashamed of how I'm living. I've been there. Well, that's what this song is for. It's designed not to make you feel guilty, to give you an opportunity to change. Reflect on your life. If you're not living the way you ought to live, if other things have gotten away, you need to change it. You need to change it today. And from time to time, we need to do something radical. And maybe for you, you may be going, I never went to the front. Doesn't matter. Rededicate yourself. Rededicate your path. Think about your family. Bone of my bones. And think about when you come to the end of your life, what's going to be fulfilling is to look and see a family who loves the Lord. Children who love and follow the Lord. A church who's been blessed by that effort and that work. If we can help you today, please come as we sing.